my, my sister often says after I, I talk that during the talk, she's convinced she understands everything I'm saying, but as soon as she leaves, she realizes she really had no, no clue. So uh, I don't want that to happen today. So I'm gonna tell you a few things that will help you through the entire talk. First of all, I'm an engineer and a biologist. So we have no new math, no new physics. The way we keep you out of our field is by a complicated vocabulary. <laughs> so if I fall back and I, I say things that are pure gibberish, when you bring us out and ask questions, uh, make sure I tell you about it. Because what we're doing is actually very simple. We are reading the computer program of life. Everybody in this room knows that their computer is instructed by a series of ones and zeros that make up their software. The software on their cell phone, software on their computer, the software underlying the internet. In the same way, I have been developing tools to read off, instead of the ones and zeros, the very elegant chemical code of life. And it is a quaternary code. All that means is there's four states instead of two. We have A, C, G's, and T's. And each of you sitting there has a computer program on your chromosomes, which is six billion of these A, C, and G's, and T's. And you got three billion from your mom and three billion from your dad. And an AIDS virus also has a program. Its program is 9,000 letters long. So I'm gonna talk about the tools and why these tools can help us heal the world, feed the world, and fuel the world. Because underlying all of those endeavors now, especially trying to do it in a clean fashion, is organisms, and all of those organisms are instructed by their code. So let's, let's start uh, with this summer. This summer, most of you are probably aware, there was an outbreak in Germany, and people were dying. Over 800 people had been rushed uh, to the emergency room with kidney failure. And underlying that was uh, a new E. coli that somehow in had instructions that were much more dangerous than the instructions in the E. coli that each of you carried. And what scientists were able to do and when scientists do things, they like sharing it with the world through publications, what scientists were able to do was decode the instruction set for this new killer bacteria. And what, what's interesting about this is this was done faster than ever before and in a different way than ever before. So right while the outbreak was happening, scientists in Germany, scientists in China, decoded the five million letters that underlied this bug, but just like a computer program that you were trying to decipher, you'd have to then look at that code and say, what does it do? Well, what these scientists did for the first time was in real time, as they decoded this bug, they put these five million letters, which were arranged in long strings, just like uh, sentences and words and paragraphs and chapters, and they put that on the internet. And in real time, other scientists around the world looked at that code in the same way if you're a computer program, you'd look at somebody else's code, and they said, we got it. This bug encodes genes that make it resistant to 14 antibiotics. This bug encodes a toxin which is killing these people's kidneys. This bug carries genes that say it actually came from the gut of an animal, so we know that uh, whatever food source was contaminated by dirty water that had this E. coli. And a bug doesn't carry extra genes to go to war against 14 antibiotics unless it's in a battle. So somebody was probably feeding this cow tons of antibiotics. I don't want to get into the uh, social ramifications, but in the United States, 80% of antibiotics are used in animals, and most are used just what the heck every day put in the feed. So this was a bug, and it was a bug we created. But I want to talk about the tools and how we got to the point that we could, in the middle of an outbreak, decode this and then quickly make a diagnostic. So the scientists decoded it. 
The information was in the internet, this five million letters, and then quickly, scientists could make a diagnostic that cost less than a dollar to check any food supply and see if it had this deadly bug. And in the future, whenever there's an outbreak in a hospital, we can quickly check for literally a dollar if this bug ha has come back. So I want to start at the beginning. I want to start at the world's first human or, or uh, genome hacker. And it was a guy called Frederick Sanger. And in 1976, he gave the world a way to decode for the first time the DNA of a living organism. Watson and Crick, who you know, had given us the basis of heredity, and he said the basis of heredity was the DNA that an organism passes down to its offspring. But it was Francis Crick and uh, uh, Jim Watson that, uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, Frederick Sanger who worked out a way to quickly decode it. And the first organism he read off had a genome of only a few thousand letters. It was a small virus that actually infects bacteria. But it gave the world a new tool to read this computer program. And the ability to read that program is relevant to everybody in the room because it was the reading of DNA and the subsequent use of that reading to make uh, uh, drugs that gave us the entire biotechnology industry. So it was a very, very powerful tool and very useful. Uh, a decade later, some scientists at, at Caltech automated it, and automating it allowed us to go from reading 5,000 letters to reading a few billion letters, uh, uh, the few billion letters in the human genome. But in fact, we didn't read an individual. This was an effort that took 10 years, cost three billion bucks, but we read was a consensus a public effort from around the world mixed up 50 people and tried to make a map of what's common in those 50 people. And a private effort took about uh, six people and tried to make a map of it. But both efforts either cost $3 billion or cost uh, a, a billion dollars. Uh, so they gave us a map, but they really didn't help us as individuals. Well, like most of you, I'm motivated by things that matter most to me. And what mattered most to me in 1999 was the, son, was the birth of my son, Noah. Noah uh, was rushed to the newborn intensive care unit, and he wasn't breathing. And I was in the genome business, and uh, I, I'm going to tell a little history, but also a little personal story. I thought I was on top of the world. I was an entrepreneur. I had a company that had took public. We were one of the best stacks, stocks on the NASDAQ. Uh, my company was worth more than American Airlines. I thought I was riding pretty high. And I had been harnessing that genome map to make drugs uh, for cancer. Uh, one of those drugs is actually now in trials for triple negative breast cancer. But I thought I was on top of the world. But what I realized at that moment, when my son wasn't breathing, is I wasn't too interested in this generic map of the human genome. I really wanted to know what was wrong with my son. I did not want to know a generic map of the genome. I wanted his genome. And uh, that night, there was a computer magazine out, and I saw a picture of a new Pentium chip. And I realized we had all been taking the wrong approach, approach to sequencing, myself included. We had been taking a Henry Ford approach. We had set up large factories with automation and machines and spent hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to decode. And what we needed to do was move it into the miniature. And uh, uh, that night, uh, that was my contribution. I said, let's make it miniature. And as an entrepreneur, I gathered the smartest people I could find, and we made a business of making a machine that for the first time would really quickly decode genomes, whether it was a virus, a bacteria, or, or a human. And when we did it, there were some people that said, this is going to be big. So as a company, we quickly put them on our advisory board. <laughs> and uh, there were some people that said it would never work, so we avoided them at all costs. One of the people that said it was going to be uh, big is actually speaking tomorrow, Ian Lipkin, and he was one of the first people to use it in uh, epidemiology, use it to uh, understand these outbreaks, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So what we did, and I want to make this concrete, because again, everything we do is conceptually pretty simple, except the clicker, <laughs> is we made a machine that could make any laboratory that was fantastically rich uh, be able to be a genome center. And so 
for a half a million dollars in facility and computing and for half a million dollars of equipment, you could be in the genome sequencing business. And that was good. And we were able to commercialize the machine, get it out there, and people did things that were spectacular. Uh, some group at Cold Spring Harbor took water, seawater, and threw it on the machine after they isolated all the DNA. It's easy to get DNA. It has a property that allows you to extract it very easily. And they threw all the DNA from an ounce of seawater. And it turns out there was over a million different organisms in an ounce of water. So people did fantastic things. And I'm going to give you a survey of that just to give you a feel for what you can do with DNA sequencing and what you can do as it becomes cheaper and more ubiquitous. So first thing that happened is when you first start something, while it's cheaper, it's still relatively expensive. So that's where pharmaceutical companies come in, because they're relatively rich. So we worked with uh, J&J, and, &J, and they had a new drug, but they couldn't develop it. Because this drug, as you'll see in one of these uh, talks where people do folding, was kind of like a key that goes into a lock, but they didn't know what the lock was. And it's hard to make the key better if you don't have the lock. So what we did is sequence tuberculosis bugs that responded to the drug and decoded ones that didn't respond. Looked at the four or five million letters in their code and found one that was changed. And it was changed in the computer program, if you will, for the protein that was the drug target. So they were able to develop this drug, a first new drug for tuberculosis in 40 years. We worked with people uh, at Harvard who had cancer patients and they wanted to understand uh, how to treat the cancer patient. So cancer is an error in programming of your genome. Literally, you have a cell. Somewhere in it, program uh, a, a bit changes, one of these A, C, Gs, or Ts. And with some probability, it leads to a competitive advantage for that selfish cell to become more aggressive, to not care about its neighbors, and to proliferate. That's what cancer is. It's a disease of the genome of an individual. And this scientist was able to study that genome and find that it had a mutation right where a, a drug worked. And they were able to switch that patient. So you can use it to, to understand uh, bacteria. You can understand humans. Here's a case where scientists used it to understand HIV. And this was super critical. HIV's program is only 9,000 letters long. But Every single virus in somebody's blood, and there can be 10 to the 14 viruses in a mill of blood, has at least one difference from the other. So HIV is constantly searching space to avoid drugs uh, and to become more fit. It's the ultimate selfish genome. We were able to sequence HIV, and scientists were able to sequence HIV well enough that they understood how it was changing, and as you know, HIV is now becoming a chronic disease because we could study those 9,000 genes well enough to understand how to make drugs. I really do think this foreshadows something that you've been promised since 1974. You've been promised that we're going to understand cancer and we're going to make cancer drugs. And I can tell you, when it's as easy to sequence you as it is to sequence that HIV sequence, we will understand cancer well enough to make those drugs. Uh, this is something fun uh, with Ian Lipkin. Uh, he put us in a movie, which is always cool if you have a piece of equipment. Uh, but what's really important is it entered a new way to actually do a diagnostics. In this case, we didn't know what was killing these patients. Ian had patients, uh, they had gotten organs, and they just dropped dead. There was no bacteria to sequence. There was no virus to sequence. Ian and his collaborators knew nothing. All they knew was they had three dead people. And so what Ian did is he sent those samples, the physical tissues, from these three bed, dead people uh, to scientists at, at 454. And at the time, it was a new machine. He's an early adopter. We decoded those genomes and were able to tell him that there was a new virus that was killing those patients. And now you can have a screen for that before you do an organ transplant. This is another experiment that you could not have anticipated when my son wasn't breathing and we wanted to sequence quickly. Honeybees were dying. What's killing the honeybees? Well, collaborators sent samples. They sent them to our uh, center. We sequenced them. And they literally found a virus that was in the hives that were dying that wasn't in the hives uh, that were OK. So again, we've gone from helping people to helping the environment. The last is pure science fiction. 
And if I wasn't involved in it, I'd probably say, you've got to be kidding me. So uh, I have a reputation for cold calling people. I try to find the coolest people. So I said, you know, Ian, come, come work with us. Richard Gibbs, come work with us. I called a scientist who's amazing. You've got to have him speak here, Svante Pavel. So Svante studies Neanderthal. And for 10 years, he wanted to sequence Neanderthal, but couldn't because it had two problems. One, there was very little DNA left. So DNA breaks down over time. So after 40,000 years, which is the most recent Neanderthal samples you can get, uh, it, it's hard to get the DNA. And the DNA, instead of beautifully laid out in chromosomes like it is in each of you, was fragmented to little pieces, 50, 80, 100 long. I called him and said, Svante, send me some dinosaur DNA. I'm ready to go. He explained to me that he couldn't send dinosaur DNA because it really is too old. It is all gone. Can't get it from the amber. I begged him. He said, nope, none of those things are uh, reproducible. But he said, uh, <laughs> how about something like Neanderthal? So I said, fine, send it. He explained to me that people worked their whole life to get one sample. So he sent us cave bear. We showed it worked, but that day we had more DNA sequence of an extinct species than people had done in all of history. He sent us Neanderthal and we decoded it. Why is that important? Well, Neanderthal never crossed a body of water that it didn't see the other side. When we came out of Africa 50 or 70,000 years ago, we went to Easter Island. So there was a difference in our intuition, our imagination. Uh, cave drawings show we were very different than Neanderthal. The amazing thing is, now that we've sequenced Neanderthal and you compare it to a sequence of a human, it turns out there may be only 200 places in your genome, this genome of six billion letters that are really always different between us and Neanderthal and conserved with Neanderthal and the chimpanzees. So you say, you know, what is really different between us and the rest of the primates. So for the first time, we may get a handle on the genes that make us human and give us this imagination. Again, who, who would have imagined when all we wanted to do was, was sequence DNA? By the way, there are a lot of scientists talking about now that we can sequence extinct species. Why not bring them back? And while it's science fiction today, Five years from now, it won't be. You'll be able to take, and you've probably heard about this, uh, a genome of an elephant. Another group actually sequenced the woolly mammoth with our machine. There's only 400 differences. And just change those differences from an African elephant uh, to make a woolly mammoth. I'm not doing well with the clicker. All right, so I like finishing what I start. And I said I was going to sequence a genome. My son turns out to be healthy and happy. And so we sequenced Jim Watson because he gave us the basis of heredity and uh, uh, DNA. Do I point it? Do I just have patience? So that's a pretty high. <laughs> I, I, I was pretty high in my life. Uh, we had sequenced Jim Watson. I only told my mom the bad news. To my kids, I tell the good news. To my mom, I said, this is great, but the bad news is, and I'm Mom, I lost my company. Uh, somebody came in and bought it. So you're pretty low as an entrepreneur, but you don't let your kids know that. So I went to my son, Noah, and said, Noah, we had just read a genome. And he said, Dad, you read a genome. And he said it would be much more lucrative to read minds. And he had this image of being in a studio like this and Bill Gates in the audience. Uh, so I took him seriously, mostly because I was out of work. And uh, <laughs> I, I did something new. And what I did, is had a chance to rethink the thing. So this is a lesson. It's, it's OK to be down, because I was able to step back and say, maybe we had all done it wrong. We had always, since Sanger, used light to decode a genome. When you take a picture, you hold your camera up, and there's a little chip in there that sees light. So what my son inspired me to do was make a chip that sees DNA. And this has allowed us a direct portal between the chemical and uh, digital worlds. And this has allowed us to personalize this. So no longer does it cost a half a million. That bug that was decoded in Germany and uh, China was done on a $50,000 machine. It's now the best-selling machine in the world. As many of you know, a trillion dollars have gone into modern electronics and semiconductors. They always win. And we get the build on 40 years of Moore's Law. Of course, I like meeting famous people. So I took my son, we met Gordon Moore, and we sequenced his genome. 
Uh, and it's important because it shows you that uh, you can now sequence on something that gets cheaper and cheaper. I think they shut me down. All right. So I am going to wrap up. So you can sequence cheaper. And this is just a graph that will tell you it's getting so fast that this year they sequenced in Germany those 5 million letters for $99 on one of these chips. Next year this time, at companies, we'll be sequencing people for $1,000. And in 2013, we'll be sequencing people for $1,000 commercially. And what that means is in a society where you spend $6,000 a year on health care, you can really have a, a huge uh, impact. The last is an ego slide. It hurts me to show. But I said I was down when things didn't work. I was up when it works. And so I got to run to my mom and say, it, it, it works. If I can get the next slide to go on. What am I doing wrong about pushing down? Walk closer. So I was able to say, Mom, it works. It's good. And my son got what he wanted, a direct uh, way to look up uh, biology. And yes, I am working on the mind reading device. <laughs> Thanks.